uh, our friend uh, Stephen Bergman of New York Classical. Let me find another shot of him over here. Here we go. Uh, Stephen, if you are there, I'm going to go into the, uh, the, oh, I have to close this out before I can do that. And let me see if I can bring you on here. Um, Stephen, New York Classical, okay. Go live, New York Classical. So, uh, Stephen, if I, I hope I got the right uh, the right feed uh, for you to join us. Uh, Hi there. Hey, Stephen, there you are. Hey, Rodney, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. How about you, Stephen? I'm um, good. A little tired, but good. Well, uh, tired because you just came off of a, I'm sure, a marathon rehearsal for your next production of King Lear. Yes. yes okay. It's been, and, it's, been, it's been a long one. It's good. It's all good. And that is coming up this Thursday night. Thursday. That's the correct. The 25th at mm -hmm. 8 p.m. on... Mm -hmm. Facebook, right? Uh, no, no, it's it's uh, we're Zoom. It's a Zoom, but you have to register at our website, NewYorkClassical.org, NYClassical.org, to get your link. Okay, all right. So uh, something that for me is really kind of fascinating about the the fact that you're taking on King Lear right now is that you guys, for for how many years you guys have been doing New York Classical? It's about fifteen years. Twenty one. Twenty one years. Twenty one that, that, years. This year. That's. I think you guys would be probably one of the longest running continuous Shakespeare uh, companies in New York outside of the public theater. This is true. Well, a classic <laughs> stage uh, beats us a little bit, but that's here you go too. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that, well, you guys are certainly in the running. You're, you're right. Yes. Up there. Yeah, we are. We're at, We've been and, around a while. And and you guys are renowned. Uh, you've been doing your shows in Central Park for the majority of that time. That's correct. Uh, and you, you're you're very well known as one of the one of the finer uh, companies in New York, not just for Shakespeare, one of the finer classical companies. And I, I've caught your shows. I think you guys, you guys do fantastic work. And something we chatted about uh, the previous time that we, we had a chat here on Instagram Live was that you guys have a very unique style. Tell us about your for anyone who's new to uh, to this. Uh, tell us about your your style of, of how um, you conduct New York classical. Well, what, it's called panoramic theater. And it's really based on three major points. It's um, the show is adapted for each location. So, and the audience follows it from place to place. And the audience is also in the same environment as the show. So that's the, the, the kind of three pillars behind it. Okay. And so it, it, it's a very immersive environment for Shakespeare. There's no stage, there is no seating. The audience brings a blanket, oftentimes sits on the grass or stands. Um, and so it's a, it's a, it's, you're in, you know, the audience experiences the play the same way the characters are experiencing it. And, and what that meant for me, the time that I came to see your show, uh, a couple of times I came to see your shows, uh, was that, you know, normally with the, uh, Shakespeare in the park or whatever, you know, some kind of Shakespeare production year, it's, there is the, the barrier where the audience, uh, is on one side of the proceedings and the performers on the other side. And there's right. like that fourth wall between the one and the others. Mm -hmm. And, and with you guys, that's not really there so much because uh, your, your performers do a scene and then everyone says, all right, get up, get up and go, get up. And you grab your mm -hmm. blanket, you like grab your picnic basket and off you go to the next part of the park and you run with the actors and it's mm -hmm. off to the, uh, the next part of the setting. And, and it's kind of, it's built into the, the surroundings of where you are in the park. Uh, that kind of helps uh, determine the, the, what, what scene is being played, correct? That's correct. That's correct. But, you know, we, we reinterpret scenes. Um, I, years ago, uh, I think it was my third, second or third season, I was approached by a, an older gentleman who said, I spent, I've spent the last 20 years in the park, and tonight you showed it to me like I've never seen it before. <laughs> and which is great, which is great. You know, I mean, we've, we've, you know, the park has been a... Uh, a villa in Russia for the seagull. The park has been um, Illyria for Twelfth Night. Sure. The, the, you know, in, in, it's been France. It's been, uh, you know, it's been everywhere. Um, right. And, and England for sure. Many, many times over. Um, but, you know, that it's, it's a, you know, like Central Park, it's an escape for New Yorkers. And you mm -hmm. come into the park and the whole world changes. We well, Some of our um, long longest term fans love the fact that because we, when we move them around, they don't know where they end up. They get so wrapped up in the show. <laughs> and this is not just some. There's quite a few people. They just get so wrapped up in the show. Frequently, at the end of the show, people are like, how do I get out of the park? And I'm like, oh, it's right <laughs> behind you. And they're like, oh, really? I have no idea. So, so uh, and, and you've been doing that for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, now, now that after 21 years of doing uh, park-based productions, for the most part, uh, now, because of the, uh, the new situation with the coronavirus and how mm -hmm. we've had to adapt uh, what 
Shakespeare performance meetings here in New York and elsewhere, mm -hmm. uh, you've had to change to the Zoom format. So how, how is it taking this very broad physical, and I think you were telling me last time about how it, it, it's such a physical style of performance that you had to mm -hmm. make sure your actors were up to snuff, that they couldn't physically handle the rigor of running from scene to scene and had the this breath. This is true. This is true, yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm embracing uh, the strengths and the challenges of both of Zoom. Uh, one thing that works in our performance, uh, in our technique, is um, it's not, it's not uh, always, it's not, we, we do it not to be obvious, but whoever's speaking is actually flat front to the audience. The audience sees them, and that helps the projection. We don't use any amplified sound. They don't wear mics. They don't, we have no speakers or anything. And, we'll, and the technique allows them to be heard. Um, and so actually it's pleasantly surprising. Six out of the seven actors in this particular year have worked with us in the past and they just jumped right in. Okay. And, you know, but we are playing, you know, it's, I feel a bit like a film director because I'm playing with, you know, camera angles. I'm playing with, uh, you know, how close can you be? How far can you be? Things like right. that, you know. So we had decided, uh, you know, there's a different look for an aside and what happens and in this particular um, uh, show where we have seven actors playing um, 14, 18 roles, um, you know, and they're changing. And how do you do that as well? So, so how you said, I think you hit on something really important there that it's, it's almost like transitioning from stage to screen to, to film. In some ways it is, in some ways it is. And, you know, the question, our question has always been, the heart of panoramic theater, the question is, is how much is just enough? We don't want to over uh, saturate the audience's imagination. We want to maximize the audience's involvement, imagine audience's imagination and their involvement. So in the same way here, we're looking um, how, how to maximize it. What, what's it what, what's just enough so then the audience gets sucked into the story. And and you're doing it, you said, with the six actors, correct? Seven, seven actors. Seven actors. Yes. So that that in itself, it, it, you're you're minimizing in a lot of ways. You're taking a a big show and you're you're reducing it not only to the screen but also to uh, seven actors. Well, so the the, fun, the funny part was th this was the show we had planned before uh, before COVID hit. Nobody, of course, expected it, mm -hmm. and it came out of this. Uh, investigation I've been doing for a few years about what Shakespeare's company would have been like on tour. Okay. So of course, uh, ironically, I guess you'd say is, uh, Shakespeare's company w was forced to go on tour usually because of plague. So now we have our own pandemic at this time. And mm -hmm. I was, and, you know, but this came out of that investigation of, um, you know, the actors had to go on the road. They still had to make money. It was expensive to tour. How few people could they bring? How could they make the story come alive? Um, and what was necessary for it to come, you know, to be there? And uh, we did a six actor Romeo and Juliet a few seasons ago. That's what was okay. the beginning of this, this experiment. And that turned out to be very successful. And the audience loved watching the actors switch clothes on stage. And this one, it's even more, there's even mm. more. So it's been, um, we just got through, um, um, well, just past the Heath, uh, the, then the Blinding of Gloucester, and um, it's really exciting. It's really, really exciting. We we actually have our fight director on the show. He's starting tomorrow. That's We've fantastic. got um, starting tomorrow. Our voice and speech coach, who are in a if you're familiar with Zoom breakout rooms. We're doing uh -huh. breakout rooms with the voice and speech coach. We have wow. someone specifically looking at backgrounds. Uh, we don't want to um, tech it up too much because I don't want it to be a movie. It's not a movie. It's still a play. But mm -hmm. our hope is, of course, to fully produce the show um, at a later date this year, sometime in 2020. And uh, we want to make sure that this, uh, there's no disconnect. So when people can see the reading, a rehearsed reading, it's a, mm -hmm. we're hiring everyone. They're getting off unemployment for a week and a half. Uh, we're That's paying health care and pension and um, hiring everybody on a union contract. It's a real wonderful opportunity to get actors working. And and a show that uh, King Lear, you mentioned uh, how, how Shakespeare was touring uh, with his company during the breakouts of the plague, the, the bubonic plague uh, in uh, in Elizabethan England. And mm -hmm. isn't it funny that, that that one of the things that he wrote in sequestration from the plague was King Lear? Uh, well, I, I have to say that we think that was the case. We don't know for a fact. <laughs> There's a lot we don't know for a fact. And I think it's it's gotten a little bit too much in, you know, there are some scholars who disagree with that, but there's a possibility that um, it was one of the plays that was that was done. I um, 
a number of seasons ago, I directed Measure for Measure. And that actually, I, I felt the plight. It's really interesting. Some of the scenes are very kind of typically fleshed out for Shakespeare and some are very underwritten. And I thought, oh God, he must have pulled this out of a drawer and had to start, had needed a play immediately to get going. And <laughs> sure enough, they are, they're actually more sure that Measure for Measure was written during play. Really? During one of the shutdowns, yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. So, uh, we are not not one hundred percent sure. It was it was a, it's a good possibility, but not it's, not, it's not a, as good as not as sure bet as measure for measure. So uh, it, it, King Lear is famous, uh, at least in some people's eyes, uh, for the the big storm scene where mm -hmm. where Lear has his uh, so called madness and mm -hmm. you know the, the the storm rack and the whole thing. So how does one translate that? That's such a big. Uh, grand transcendent stage moment how does one tr uh, translate that well we have to think back to you know shakespeare didn't have a storm in, in the globe theater they didn't have a rain curtain what did they do that was the question that's the question i start off with you know my job i think interpreting shakespeare for a modern audience is thinking about what was shakespeare's original audience's experience and how do i translate that for our modern audience and in this case i actually look at it specifically there's a line the tempest is in my mind Lear says. So actually, Lear is going to be imagining the Tempest. Mm. And we're going to get to see the other people on stage with him, which is uh, Edmund, uh, excuse me, Edgar. Edgar's as poor Tom and the Fool and Kent, who's disguised as Caius, uh, looking at this poor mad man, thinking he's in the middle of a storm when the storm really is in his mind. Hmm, that's that's really interesting. Especially... And that keeps the audience in the in the space. That keeps the audience in the same playing space with everybody else. I think that's a really great way to approach it because you you right there it's it's in the text and you are delving right into the the matter of the madness, uh, that the madness that King Lear is uh, is experiencing there. That's correct. Right. So Stephen. Uh, people want to uh, check this out they can find it by visiting you guys at newyorkclassical.org yeah nyclassical.org and uh we have a king lear page right there you got to register to get the link and if you can't make it thursday we will be it's will be repeating all the way through sunday fantastic all right well steven best of luck i think you guys all right. are fantastic it's Thank always you. a pleasure chatting with you and i'll be different i'll be ch checking out that production on king fantastic. lear fantastic great looking forward to sharing with you take care thanks steve bye-bye all right, so that was Stephen Bergman of New York Classical. They have their production of King Lear coming up this Thursday uh, via Zoom, and we chatted about that. Uh, you can uh, check that out at nyclassical.org or on their uh, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter feeds. Uh, sign up, get your link for that uh, production. Uh, next, we will see if we have our friend uh, Linnea Benson from the Frog and Peach Theater Company. Uh, let's see if she is still with us. I know she was with us earlier. Uh, I think she is here, unable to join. Uh, let's see if I can approach that a different way. Okay. Frog and Peach. Okay, so uh, it looks like, uh, Linnea, if you're out there, I just, uh, the, the method by which I would bring you on is to kind of uh, go onto your profile and uh, click something that allows me to uh, add you to the live presentation. Unfortunately, I tried to do that and it's telling me that you are unable to join. Uh, I'll give you a couple of minutes to see if you are able to work out that technical glitch so we can have you join us. Uh, while uh, you are hopefully able to do that, let me bring up a couple of images, if I may, of Linnea and her company. Uh, let's see if I have you here. 